parks, schools, restaurants, and more, Assembly Road gets high scores. We're a thriving city with so much to do. Uncle Boston Harbor in our view. Politics, cannabis, controversial stories, heroes, villains, who gets the glory? 50 plus languages in Somerville are spoken. Sanctuary City, there are no three tokens. History in Somerville stays alive. In all American City, we won three times. Somerville connects. Somerville connects. Welcome to another edition of Dead Air Live. So happy you could join us tonight. We are ha we have the amazing Ed Gaskin, founder of Sunday Celebrations. Welcome, Ed. Well, it's great to be here. So, Ed, I have so many questions for you, but let's let's start at the beginning. What is Sunday Celebrations? And then you could tell us a little bit about you and how you got here. So Sunday Celebrations is a food company, a food brand, and uh, it was de designed and developed to make what we call good for you gourmet food. And the idea was is a lot of times people think gourmet food couldn't be good for them because gourmet food typically is very rich in caloric. So if you think of like the French style of cooking, like chocolate mousse and bernays and holidays, lots of eggs and butter and sugar and chocolate and things like that, very decadent caloric. So you think, well, obviously if it's gourmet, then it couldn't possibly be good. And so what we wanted to do was, from like a paradoxical standpoint, could we make something that was gourmet and good for you? So that's why we call it gourmet, good for you food. And can you make something that's gourmet and good for you? Yes, we can, because that's what we did. All right. So, Ed, let's talk a little bit about you for the moment, and we'll get back to Sunday celebrations. Tell us a little bit about yourself you, we live in the Boston area, correct? And I was reading a little bit about you today and you grew up on a farm, which kind of blew my mind. Uh, uh, you were very involved with getting involved with vegetables and fruits and things like that. So tell us about yourself. How did you arrive here at Somerville Media Center? Okay, well, <clears throat> I didn't grow up on a farm. Oh, you did it. Okay. I grew up in the Midwest okay. in a small town called Cassopolis, Michigan, which has a population of about 2,000. And it's one of the largest towns in the area. Like the next one's like 500, and it goes down from there. And um, grew up with a uh, about a half an acre of uh, vegetable, fruit and vegetable garden in the back. And so... Um, I, because of that, I sort of learned to eat and like all different kinds of uh, fruits and vegetables, and even the potatoes. So people say, "Oh, I don't like spinach. I don't, I don't like lima beans." But I learned in, to eat all of them. And uh, for instance, I even remember in the summers as a child, um, we had carrots, and it wouldn't be anything for me to just pull a carrot out of the ground and eat it. You know, just <laughs> it's like, it's like it tastes like candy. Well, because you know, I didn't know about oh, you're supposed to rinse it off, whatever. Because if in the summer the ground gets very dry, and so it's almost like dust, so it's like this comes right out, and there's like no dirt or anything on it. Um, so anyway, so that was that was my background. Um, so I was in 4-H, and I exhibited stuff in the county fair. And um, what kind of things did you exhibit? Uh, well, uh, well, one fair? year I I won best dahlia. <laughs> Is that's a plant? That's a flower. That's a flower. Oh my goodness! I should know this. Okay. I I won an award one time because I for my okra that I grew. But really? Anyway, How old were you? I don't know. I was just a kid. Okay. But I did those kind of things, and I went to a school, you know, and we had, we had a, a Future Farmers of America club. I wasn't in that, and every year we had, like, the barn dance. So anyway, so that actually became the uh, being around fruits and vegetables and that kind of thing is sort of what I was able to draw on later on when I started Sunday Celebrations because I had this background. The name Sunday Celebrations, where did the name come from? Well, the idea was that... Um, most of the good times we have or celebratory things have include food of some way, shape, or form. And so it was making a difference between, let's say like TGIF, thank God it's Friday, which is more of a partying thing than on the Sunday dinner. And so an American uh, style of 
uh, dining and entertaining, a lot of times people were just too busy Monday through Friday to actually cook anything. And so if you're going to have any kind of prepared meal, most likely it's going to be on a Sunday. Or it's going to be around things like Thanksgiving or Easter or Christmas, those kind of dinners, and where you have family and friends over. And at those times, um, you really want something to be special or different, whatever, because you're entertaining your, your guests. And... Um, that was one of the things that I was trying to anchor on. And also, what I noticed over the years is that a lot of times if you have a lot of family over, or friends, any kind of size dinner party, um, one or more of them is on a special diet. Somebody's on a low-fat diet, low-salt diet, because they have hypertension. Somebody is allergic to something. And so what I thought was always unfortunate is all the people who didn't have those restrictions would be like digging in all the food. And then the person who had the restrictions would just have to watch everybody eat because they'd get like a salad or something. So I basically wanted to be inclusive. So I said, I'm going to develop food that everybody at the table can eat no matter what diet they're on or uh, whatever health restrictions they have. You're a sweet man. <laughs> You're very considerate. And your food has little to no salt fat, or sugar. How do you achieve that and get something and come up with something that's really tasty? Well, um, and it's free of the top eight <laughs> allergens. Well, the issue was that um, when I was doing my research, I didn't I discovered that basically something like 60 to 80% of all dietary diseases are basically type 2 diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. Just those four, just those four alone. And so uh, those are highly correlated with salt, fat, and sugar. So I thought using the dinner party example again, the last thing you want to do is invite guests over to your house and kill them because you you know have all this unhealthy food. So the issue for me was that if you tried to find definitions of what was healthy, so there's different diets, different philosophies, like the FDA has like four different levels of health claims. Oh, that, that blows <laughs> my mind. I, that's another whole topic. How so, can they have... Um, well, they have like an A-level claim, a B-level claim, a C-level claim, and a D-level claim. So there's different levels of claims. So I said, instead of trying to figure out what's healthy, and then you'll see people who add active ingredients of, you know, something to actually make something better. Which, and we don't even know what half the ingredients mean. They're like these long words. So I said, why don't we just go the other way, since we know that... Um, What's unhealthy, why don't we just make food that's not unhealthy? And so if you look at the standard American diet or the Western pattern diet, whatever, everybody says that part of the problem is that we consume too much fat, too much salt, too much sugar. And again, I wasn't trying to take a position on healthy fats, unhealthy fats. I was just saying we just overconsume all of that. So for example, um, it's almost like universally worldwide, like from the World Health Organization on, it says you shouldn't have more than 2,300 milligrams of sodium a day. The average American is over 4,000 a day. So basically, that's almost like a toxic level of sodium every single day. So, and the same thing with the same thing with the fat. We, we way overconsume fat. And so the issue for me was, well, let me see if I can make these things without any of those three things. And then the allergens issue was simply trying to say, well, what does it have to do to be inclusive? So it turned out that when we did that, we were able to, at the time, uh, I think the top 23 diets is recognized by U.S. News and World Report. Our products fit every single category. So you could be on any one of those diets and eat our food. Um, so it wouldn't be like you were on this diet and then you you didn't like that diet and work out for you and you switched to another diet, so therefore you had to switch food. We wanted to make food that's basically diet agnostic. And so if you remember, at one point, um, a diet like Atkins was very successful and it became a $400 million company. But not too many years after that, it actually filed for bankruptcy because people switched to another diet. So we didn't want to make products that were so diet dependent that when they went out of favor, that, that would be the end of our business. So, so what food groups are you... What is Sunday celebrations? What food groups do you cover or have you covered? So... To answer your first question about how to come up with something, so typically what happens is uh, 
So let's say, for instance, let's take the salad dressings. If you were trying to do Thousand Island, blue cheese, French, ranch, whatever, mm -hmm. those are typically um, in the 60% 60, 60 uh, fat of some type, olive oil, canola oil, something. Mm -hmm. And um, they typically have egg, they would have some kind of dairy, depending on the, the ones in particular. So what typically happens, let's say you were having a vegan salad dressing, uh, and you were using soy instead of um, like eggs or something, then what happens is is you as a consumer notice the difference. You say, well, this doesn't taste like what I'm used to because they've made all these different kinds of substitutions. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you try to use like an egg substitute or a salt substitute, um, it's sort of noticeably different. Now, sometimes people who are vegan or vegetarian, whatever, they might do that and just get used to the differences. But typically when people do that, they feel that they're sacrificing and they're giving something up because it doesn't taste like what they're used to. Mm -hmm. So in our case, um, when we did the first salad dressings, we did mimosa and we did strawberries and champagne. When and you say we, who is... Who is who is we? <laughs> well, myself and the sort of people I, I put together. So I had um, hired uh, top chefs, people from like Martha Stewart, William Sonoma. I had... Um, how do you know these people? It, I, I mean, how do you get in touch with these people? You have these ideas, and then you find these people. Well, because I knew what the, I knew what the goal was. The goal was we're going to make gourmet food that's good for you. And so therefore, I wanted to focus on um, gourmet chefs and things like that. Okay. Uh, people from America's Test Kitchen. You know, at the end, at the very end, I even was able to get people like Barbara Lynch and Jody Adams to help me um, because I wanted to know that what we had come up with was, in fact, gourmet quality product. Anyway, so the point is, if you have, uh, let's say you had our mimosa salad dressing or our watermelon gazpacho or something like that, and you tasted it, um, you would probably like it. But you wouldn't be dissatisfied because it doesn't taste like what you're used to because there is no such thing. So we just created all these things. So there's no reference. Okay. These these um, salad dressings and marinades that you've created, and I asked you this earlier, uh, do you spend a lot of time in the kitchen? So the short answer to that is no. And so how do you come up with these ideas if you're not in the kitchen, if you're not experimenting? Okay, so um, so in terms of inspirations and things like that, I look for all kinds of things, but I'll give you some examples. So let's say you had a garden salad in front of you, right? Sure. So a garden salad might have a cucumber, might have a tomato, might have a carrot, something like that. So with a carrot, I said, what are the kind of things that are made from carrots? And in that case, uh, one of the creations was a carrot orange gram marsala. So if you're familiar yeah. with Indian food, then that's a, that's a carrot-based product. So why not have a carrot-based um, salad dressing? And I, like I use the example of tomato. So we have a salad dressing that is um, called tomato with Virgin Mary spices. So it's basically tomato puree with this type of spices you'd find in a, in a Bloody Mary. So you told me that how a musician comes up with songs in their head, you come up with these concoctions in your head. Okay. Right? Yes. Which is pretty amazing because you would think if you're going to create something that people eat, you're going to be in the kitchen and you're going to be tasting, ooh, this tastes good. Ooh, this, add a little bit of this. Ooh, add a little bit of that. But you're saying you're not doing that. No, because people have already, people have already determined that uh, they like mimosa. So if they like mimosa, they like the taste of pineapple and, in our case, it's pineapple and mango and champagne. So then the question is, um, can we do a variation on that? But you're, you're, you're making this a, a, applicable to other things like salads and marinades, which may be meats. So you're using certain things that maybe people drink, that you're using it on top of foods, or they're cooking. And, and also, too, if you have a marinade, and you put it in the uh, uh, marinades that eventually go in the oven. I mean, they, they sit around for a while, they marinate, then you put it in the oven. Doesn't the taste change? Or doesn't it break down into more sugar? So that's true depending on what the base is. But again, getting back to your question, so, um, so for instance, like if you go to a Chinese restaurant, for instance, you might have a sweet and sour sauce. 
As, as Yo, a, that's a lot of sugar. <laughs> so in our case, what we did is we mixed um, tart cherries and sweet cherries. So that's how we were able to make a sweet and sour sauce that has no sugar in it. I mean, it gives and it gives you that combination of, of um, cherry flavors. And so using that as a marinade works, but you could use it as, as a dressing as well. But the idea is it's a flavor profile that you're used to. And if you like the taste of cherry, otherwise, why would you be using the cherry dressing? Then it tastes like cherries. Right, right. So you have a mission statement. What is your mission statement? So our focus is to reduce the incidence of diet-related disease. Okay, and <laughs> the diseases as we talked about is diabetes. Yes, basically chronic, chronic disease and diseases related to inflammation, but all of the ones are related to diet. Okay, uh, and why this mission? You have public policy, public health crisis, and we are in a big health crisis. People are getting so, they're getting fat. They're getting fat. We're in the fattest nation in the world. I see. So um, <clears throat> there was basically a couple different sort of motivations. First of all, um, when you talk about the type two, the chronic diseases, type two diabetes, obesity, cholesterol, and cancer, um, if you think about the morbidity and mortality. So, for instance, when people get cancer, and if you know anybody, and, it's, and a third of all cancers are diet related, and they have to have chemotherapy or whatever, it's such a horrible thing. So. That is a way to basically help people. Um, you know, somebody has a heart attack because of, of uh, cardiovascular disease. Again, you know, th taking splitting somebody's chest open and all that. The idea is that we're really trying to do things for the greater good. So you know that if we could give people better, healthier choices, it would make a difference. And the focus there really is that a lot of times you say, well, if we did education, then people would know better and they would make different choices. Or if we taxed it, like you have a sugar tax, so people won't have soft drinks. I like that idea. Well, I know, but it's hard to get people to comply. It's much better to get people to prefer something. So we can make products that people prefer. You know what, you're, you're, you're right. If something's forced, people are gonna rebel. That doesn't always work. So that's what so we, so we know from the experience of trying to get people to stop smoking how hard that is with all the campaigns. Well, people things. are addicted. Yeah. So the idea is, um, could we make products that people prefer? So they just have to switch brands. They don't have to change their lifestyle or do the other kinds of things. You're making it easy for them. We're, we're trying to make it easier for people to be healthier. Now I'd go back to the public health crisis part of it. So the so the cost. There's two things. One is you have like the 76 million aging baby boomers who... 76 million? Holy cow! So you have these people that, as they age, there's a high correlation with them on some type of chronic disease. Mm -hmm. So the issue is, um, more likely than not, they will have their primary care physician tell them at some point they need to go on a low-fat diet or a low-salt diet or a low-sugar diet, and then they're going to look at this kind of choices they have in the store, and they're not going to like them, and so they'll be unhappy. So by providing products that they can enjoy and have a satisfying experience, it makes them easy to can be compliant with the diet that their physician has recommended, but they can also enjoy their food. But there's more to it than that, <clears throat> because... The issue is is that those diseases are basically what's driving up the healthcare costs. So um, right now, for instance, everybody's really focused on access to healthcare, the quality of care, pre-existing conditions, and so if you think of the the debate, it's about making sure people have healthcare. But the but what we're trying to say is let's be more preventative. So if you were to change your diet. Basically, about 76% of all um, health care costs could be prevented, and most of that is from diet. And therefore, it would be a better way. So I think we already spent like $3.5 trillion on health care-related expenses. So we could potentially reduce that by three quarters if we could just get people to change their diet. So there's lots of implications of what we're trying to do if you, if you sort of follow the big picture. So anyway, so for me, that's enough of a motivation to say, let's see if we can't succeed at this. So the alternatives are what you're doing. What will your dressings and marinades, how will the label read? Why will the people want to buy your product 
versus what they see in the store shelves. Well, um, they, it's not going to read any different. So unless you were, unless you were trained to read the label, so some people are, for example. So they would say, let's say, for, again, we do more than just the salad dressings and the marinades, but let's just stick with that. So if you were looking at a, a typical salad dressing, it might have um, 140 calories in it. Which, and again, in the little two tablespoons of dressing. That adds up. That's a lot. So a light dressing might have um, 50 to 70 calories in it. And our dressing has some 25 calories. I want to I wanna try it. <laughs> so the point is, because again, you have to keep thinking about what we're doing here. We're coming back to giving you basically a fruit or a vegetable. Okay, so, okay, but here's a problem. Okay. You're going to put this on the shelf. You're going to put preservatives in it. No, we, would, we don't oh, have any I mean, shelf life. What's the shelf life? So when we tested the shelf life, it was 4.2 months. Is that good? Well, um, it's longer than juice. Does it have to be refrigerated? Um, we did make it shelf stable. So if it was refrigerated, it would last longer. It's a, it's a, it's a challenge because in the industry, it takes so long to move it from where you manufacture it to where it's warehoused to getting on the store shelves and have enough time to sell. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the industry, that's, that's rather short. Um, I'm, so here's, here's the problem. If you read something on the label and it says, it has like a best buy date and it's two years from now, what that basically means is the manufacturer killed everything that was in there. Because what makes food spoil is bacteria. So if you basically kill it so there's nothing alive, there's no nutritional value left, it'll stay there for a decade eventually. Um, so the part of what you want is you really want the sort of the, the, the active ingredients. So that's why, for instance, if you see people who buy um, cold pressed juice, Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't last very long because there's, there's nothing to preserve it. But in that particular case, you're getting the maximum amount of benefit from the, from the, the, the vegetables or the fruit or whatever. So you said that you do other things besides marinades, mm -hmm. salad dressings. You talked about ketchup earlier. Um, so we... Um, so ketchup. So we, 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 what we are trying to do is we're focusing on things that, that have a higher turn and so here's the example. There's a conventional wisdom says that um, you're only supposed to eat from the periphery of the grocery store, or whatever. That's right. Okay, so the issue is most people are not going to have enough time to make their ketchup from scratch, right? So you're not going to, so you, you still have that much time. Right. Most women work, most women still most of the, do most of the cooking. So therefore. This doesn't <laughs> sound fair. That's another topic. I understand, but I'm just explaining. So, <laughs> right. right? So. There's just not the time to make all the stuff that's in the center aisle. Right. So if we made, for example, a ketchup, which we do, the two of the top three ingredients in ketchup is salt and sugar. And so you, you may not know that or may not think about that, but so you're just adding all that sugar in everything that, that you're eating. So when we did ketchup, um, we did things like... Um, like a Tex-Mex kind of a ketchup or a mm -hmm. Cajun ketchup or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, we could take out the salt and sugar and create a different kind of experience. Um, we do pasta on the, on the cheese side. So for instance, like if you have the white pastas like Alfredo and cheese, etc., no, it's almost like 70, 80% fat. Um, plus it's dairy. And remember, all, none of our products have dairy, so they're all, those, that's an allergen. And so, you know, us making a white pasta sauce that has no dairy and no, no allergens. How do you achieve that? <laughs> well, again, you just have to think about what is it that you're trying to, what is it you're trying to create? So, for instance, <clears throat> um, you, as you're, based on your Italian experience, you might not like this, <clears throat> but we would do um, jerk, a version of jerk, and we would do red Thai chili. Um, and my friends are Italian. Like, oh, that, that's like blasphemy! Like, there's no white, there's no white sauce. Yeah, so that, that's like so different from what we were thinking about. <laughs> it is okay. So when I think of jerk, it's like beef jerky. Is that what you're talking? No, about? like jerk, like Jamaican jerk seasoning. Oh, I have no idea what that is. Or chimichurri. That's oh, I know what that is. Yes. So yeah, so I've had, uh, I've done a, a chimichurri pasta sauce. I've done a tomato, like tomato soup. Because the idea is you have a chicken. Um, tomato soup 
you might have like tomato cheese sandwich, right? Like grilled cheese with tomato. Do you use nutritional yeast? No, I don't. And what? what how, how are you creating that cheesy dairy? I know. It, so first of all, um, like, you know, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. Well, first of all, does it have to be cheesy? Everyone loves cheese. I understand. So, but I'm just saying, in the same way that I gave the example with the strawberry and champagne salad dressing, if I had, let's say you had the um, the noodles, you had the little fettuccine noodles, and you had a cream sauce, and maybe it was like a bechamel or whatever kind of a sauce, and it had chimichurri or, or jerk or red Thai chili, and you put it over the pasta, um, it would be fine. Nobody would think anything of it. It would just be different. It sounds like you're trying to retrain our taste buds to going back to all all natural, getting us away from salt and sugar, and we would be very content. We would lower our health care costs around the world, and we'd all be a lot thinner. Well, Does I, this sound like the ideal world? Well, all I'm trying to do is make... A, a product that you will have a satisfying experience. Products, products. So tell us some of your products. You have salad dressings, marinades, ketchup, pasta. What no, else? Well, pasta sauce. So normally the white sauce, because most people uh, feel a little bit more comfortable with the red sauces in terms of their healthiness. Um, I would have your all natural white sauce. And how many calories? Well, there's not going to be any calories in it because it's it's not, again, so chimichurri is sort of like um, chopped parsley. I mean, okay. Anyway. Um, and that's that's no calories. Yeah, so I'm just saying, you, so you, you're talking about seasoning, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, something like that, you know, we looked at a range of different ways to season food. In that case, seasoned pasta sauce. Um, uh, so, t for example... We did uh, gravy, so gravy is very high in fat. See, when I think of gravy, I'm Italian, I think of sauce. I see. Well, so I just meant like a brown gravy, gravy or turkey right. gravy. Right. So we make a gravy using um, apples and cranberries. Wow. Okay. That's, so, that's different. Well, it is different, but let's say, let's, so let's just use But it that. sounds yummy. So let's say, for instance, you have your turkey for Thanksgiving. Right. And so, again, what ha what's happening there is the, um, the apples and cranberries uh, oxidize. You know, when you leave a, you, you know when you leave an apple on the table, it turns brown? Yes, we had this conversation last week. Okay, so, <laughs> the, um, so the, the apples and cranberries, if you were cooking them, would turn brown in a sauce. Mm -hmm. So now it starts to look like the color of gravy. And then if you're adding like the pepper and the other kinds of seasoning that you might put in your gravy, and then when you put it over the turkey, like the meat, you have this light brown gravy um, that tastes like apples and cranberries, or you could make it with um, cranberries if you wanted to. It absolutely sounds fabulous. <laughs> but it's not going to have any, it's not going to have the salt and sugar, and it's not going to have any fat. There's no fat in it because you're using fruit juices. And we're not, uh, this, this is fabulous, Ed. But anyway, I'm just explaining the sure, different sure. categories. So, yeah, yeah. so um, jelly, so jelly is about 65% sugar. So um, we can make, I, I could make a black forest jelly or like a watermelon mimosa or, or just regular mimosa as a jelly that wouldn't have any sugar in it, have zero sugar. It's only going to have whatever the trace amounts of sugar that are in the fruit. I'm, I'm getting hungry. Oh, stop. <laughs> Okay, but the so, idea is to focus on those kind of cate categories. I, in earlier, I was talking about the fruit syrups for like pancake, waffles, French toast, and you know, same kind of thing. Using the using the fruits in the consistency that's a syrup, and then being able to use that because it doesn't, it's not going to have any added sugar to it. So it sounds like what you make are it's like the condiments that yes. you that you add on to things. You want to focus, we decided we want to focus on those things because they're going to sell the most in the store. So the amount of time that you need to preserve them isn't very long, right? Be, because they're consumable over and over and over That's again. That's correct. So otherwise, so if, if you were, so, um, so we make a raspberry teriyaki, for example. Um, and in that particular case, teriyaki is very typically extremely high in sodium. 
and it also has soy. So soy is one of the eight allergens. So in our case, we are doing it without soy and without sodium. Coconut aminos? No. So what are you what are you using? Is or is this a secret sauce? It's no not, pun intended. It's not. It's not the issue. The secret. But you have to realize that um, when you're eating. It's not just a sense of taste because it's all around perception. It's it's what we see. So part of it is what you see, um, what you smell, and things like that. So first of all, if you read the label and it says, "Hi, I'm raspberry teriyaki," you're already expecting it to taste like teriyaki. Correct. Um, now. It doesn't have to have soy in it, and it doesn't have to have sodium in it. So there's other things that might make you perceive that you're tasting that when that without that actually being in it. Um, okay. So, so all I'm just simply saying is, it's like it's like if one person um, tastes something and they say, "Oh, this is way too spicy," and the other person says, "Oh, it's just right," or somebody will taste something like cilantro and they say, "Oh, that tastes awful." Um, so people perceive taste very differently. And so that tells you how much of the mental process. So a lot of times when you're focusing, like if you are a chef, you're really focusing on the actual physical taste, but there's actually more senses that are involved. And so what we do is we try to use all the senses to create that experience. So the senses are the smell, yeah, so the taste, right, the sight, right. what else? Or, or you could touch it. Exactly, and hearing it. So for example, it's- Oh, a, like the crackle. Exactly. Right. So for instance, if you had a potato chip and it didn't crack, you would, you would know that something's wrong oh with it. Oh my goodness, that would be devastating. But like, even, no crackle? But, but I'm just saying, so before you've even put it in your mouth to taste it, right. you know something is wrong because it didn't crunch, it didn't crack. Right, right. Well, one of the things that I do now, you'll love this, um, I'm not having things like chips or that sort of thing. So my new thing is I grab a fistful of spinach. Okay. That's organic. Okay. I put it in a bowl and I get some herbamir, which is created. It's a sodium. Uh, it's created from herbs, but it has a sodium, you know, taste. And when I crackle, when I taste the the, the spinach, it crackles. So I'm getting the crunch, and the salt, and I'm content. That's sort of like what you're doing with your foods. You're creating the sensations, but you're using healthier versions. That is correct. So I hit the nail on the head. Yeah. Oh, so, so I can go home now. No, no, no. Now. <laughs> no, but the idea is, is we, what we say is we like to start from the molecule up. So, oh. So, because you're just starting from scratch. So a lot of times what happens is, is somebody will say, you know, this is a recipe they got from their mother, their grandmother, it was passed down, or, right. or they came up with something and it was, a, you know, every, all their friends and neighbors like it. So like using the example on the jelly. So jelly, if you look at any recipe, basically has to do with pectin. In order for pectin to set, you have to have the sugar. And uh, so if you try to use other things, like you might use stevia, you might use apple juice, you might use gelatin. So if you use gelatin, then it's not vegan. So there's these kind of things, but that's, that's sort of the range. However, if you were to ask a chemist, like an elementary school teacher, and you said, uh, we, want, we want to make a liquid congeal, and there's lots of different ways to make that happen. But if you, so what I'm saying, so if you're open to new ways of making that happen, then you don't have to use a pectin, which means you don't have to use sugar. What do you use? Um, well, there's lots of different possibilities. So for instance, you could use different kinds of gums as an example. So a lot of times you'll read a product that has like a, a xanthan gum in it or whatever. So there's a range of things that you could use. You could use, um, other products that are, for instance, like people will use um, chia seed flour as an example. Oh, right. Okay, sure. And so, so I'm just saying there's a range of ways to do it if you're wanting to do it differently than the way it's always been done. This is fabulous. So that's why I meant starting with starting from the molecule, starting with a blank slate, and figuring out what is it that we're trying to achieve. So in our case, it's just very clear: salt, fat, and sugar, no allergens. So if we can create it with those the, within those parameters, then we want to do it. So everything from us is starting with a fruit or a vegetable, and we're building on that. It's beautiful. Now. Tell us some of your salad dressings because pretty amazing. You've already talked about the mimosa with the mango and orange with champagne vinegar. That sounds yummy. Okay. Go ahead. What are the other ones? 
Um, strawberries. We, well, we did talk about strawberries and champagne earlier. Uh, we talked about blueberries and red wine. We talked about um, the carrot orange grand marsala. We talked about the watermelon gazpacho. And the tomato with the virgin. Very spices. That's right. true. Uh, we, one of my favorites is actually a, um, a honeydew melon and cucumber. Oh, that sounds fabulous. Oh, uh, it's so, it's like being in a spa. It's like very refreshing. I can't, did you bring any samples? Well, it doesn't matter. The audience can't taste them anyway. But I, but I can't. I'm here. I see. Okay, how many calories are in each serving? No, they're they're like tiny because it's just a little bit of fruit. Well, you're, how much? You're, you're talking about 25 or less. Some Is of, this some, for like a teaspoon, a tablespoon? Yeah, so you're talking about, there's nothing there. Like, like take a cucumber and melon. Like how many calories are going to be in those anyway? Nothing. So I'm just saying, so therefore, a lot of times they'll tell you about not, if you're, especially if you're on some kind of diet, they'll talk about don't put too much salad dressing on because it has so many calories. Mm -hmm. In our case, you can drink the whole bottle. It's not going to make any difference. Okay. So what's the market opportunity with all of this? Um, well. How much would it save the medical industry? Oh, I don't know how much. I mean, there's, there's, uh, let's just take the first one. So when we did the market sizing, it's somewhere between 91 billion and 225 billion. And the low end is based on if you just got people who are already eating natural organic food and they'd switch brands per se. And the high end is if you've got people who quote unquote didn't eat that healthy and switched to it. So an example of that was, um, the Impossible Burger, the the, 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 the plant-based burger. That I heard seen? about. How did that? Did what became of that? Well, or I mean, is it still happening? No, everybody's eating it now. Oh, but, they are. Yes, I have seen like Wendy's has no Wendy. I mean, um, Burger King has an Impossible Burger. And uh, the people are buying it. They're eating uh, yes, it, and yes, they're happy. Yes, but they still put it in the roll, the yes. the, the wheat, which is not <laughs> healthy. <laughs> Look. Anyway, um, the point was that the entire vegan vegetarian market was only estimated to be about four billion dollars. So the size of a of a of a beef patty alternative would have had to have been some fraction of that. Um, the people of the Impossible Burger now believe that they're going to do thirty five billion dollars just in that type of product. And that's because you have lots of people who are more health conscious. They know they should be eating less meat, less fat, and things like that. So they're switching from hamburger to the Impossible Burger. There's, there's two major competitors. But the point was what we call the flexitarians. All these people who weren't really part of the market before have now become part of the market. And so that's why when I was saying you have this range between 91 billion and 225 billion, why it's such a big range is because you don't know that there's new people who aren't going to come into the market. And I was using that as an example. It's great. Okay, so you have listed here a few people, a few companies, the next billion dollar brand. Yeah. You want to talk about some of those people because it's pretty interesting. I just want to be one. <laughs> you want to be one. You will be it. Don't worry. Okay. Uh, sweet green, which well, which is online salad. Well, people remember sweet greens because uh, the franchise has really exploded. And it's in all these different cities, so um, I'd love to be able to have my uh, dressings in the uh, in the sweet green franchise. And what about Soul Cycle? Their indoor cycling. Yeah, but I'm just all that is you're just you're talking about all these health and fitness. Um, brands. So for instance, like you might belong to some gyms that are ten dollars a month, right? More are you kidding no, me? No, I'm just up. saying if you yeah, look yeah, at yeah, sure, more than that. Some of them are ten dollars a month. Soul cycle is probably twenty five dollars a class. So there's people who are willing to pay a lot more for these different kinds of experiences. Aren't we experiencing people that are really shot on money today and and how do people afford which brings me to the next question. What are your Salad dressings going to be priced at? Are they going to be affordable? So they they will be affordable. Um, they'll probably be between um, so they'll probably be between twelve and sixteen ounces, and they'll probably be about eight dollars. Now, if you were in a grocery store, what you might not notice is that the salad dressings are typically between eight ounces and twelve ounces, and they might be at like five ninety nine. So really, yeah. So so they're a lot more expensive than they look. They're just in very small bottles. Okay, okay. 
Uh, why Sunday Celebrations is the next billion dollar brand? <laughs> well, the idea, uh, as the way we see it, is what does it take to be a, a, a billion dollar brand in the food category? So um, if you had an example like Kind Bars, Oh, yes. Or a cliff. So what you need to do is you need to be in more than one category. Mm -hmm. So something like Kind Bars, you know, between between the bars, the snacks, granola, mm -hmm. there are multiple categories. So multiple purpose occasions, you can have, they, they have a breakfast product, a lunch product, dinner product. Mm -hmm. And so that's the idea is you really want to focus on uh, a brand that can be cross categories and multiple purpose occasions. So mm -hmm. what we're basically saying here is that we could develop those kind of products um, in the same kind of way that the brand extends itself. So whether it's like uh, Kashi would be another one that multiple ways to actually, so the, the brand could be extended. Is there anybody that's doing what you're doing? So there's, they're not doing this, but they're doing similar types of things for different reasons. So believe it or not, um, uh, Panagonia is doing it, like the clothing company. Right, right. Because uh, what their founder said is, you only buy so many jackets and outfits, but you eat all the time. That's right. So their point is to be able to create a healthier earth if you're focusing on um, like climate change and things like that. So they want to get people to switch to healthier food as a way to have a bigger impact on the planet. So that would be an example. Um, there was a, a company called Life, L-O-I-F-E. They did both restaurants and they did uh, consumer packaged goods. They split the company into two. Um, they focus on frozen food, frozen dinners. Um, then there's companies that make stuff that's like pseudo healthy. Uh, so uh, Oprah has her own brand um, that uh, Kraft Heinz is in partnership with. So like they have the cauliflower pizza crust and things like that. Which is fabulous, by the way. <laughs> yes, it's not particularly healthy. but It's, it's not? But it's pretending to be healthy because people would feel that if it's made from cauliflower, then it has to be a lot more healthier. So that's one of the problems that you have with the, the food. So let's say, for instance, you had like a an organic macaroni and cheese and you had the regular Kraft macaroni and cheese. If you actually look at the nutritional statement, they're almost exactly the same in terms of... Um, Salt, fat, sugar, uh, calories, it's just one's organic and one's not. So in terms of its impact on your body, it's almost identical. So people use organic as a proxy for healthy as opposed to what, let's say, like a dietitian who's looking at the clinical nutritional values of the product. So you're saying don't be fooled by organic if it has the same amount of fat, mm -hmm. salt. Okay, so so I always think that's is, kind of is funny. That, is that right? I am saying that. So let's say you're going into your typical natural food store. They're going to have an ice cream section. They're going to have a bakery section with cakes and all that kind of stuff. There's nothing in that that's even remotely healthy, but it might be made from um, humanely raised chickens that gave you the eggs. It might have, um, you know, organic sugar, organic flour. But it's still sugar, it's still flour, and yeah. it's still fat. <laughs> it's still a cake. Right, a so cake is a cake is yeah, a cake. Yeah, so all the ingredients might be organic, but it's not healthy right. per se. So will your label say natural, organic? Um, our label will say natural, most likely. Mm -hmm. um, so it reminds me of an experience when I went to Whole Foods, and they told me, because I was having this discussion with them, and they said, whatever you do, don't market this as healthy. And I kind of thought that was funny because I thought, isn't this Whole Foods? I think it's all about healthy. And they said, healthy food, nobody wants that. They said, um, what? Uh, they said, well, who comes in here to buy brown rice tacos, right? Because, you know, brown rice would be healthy. They said, so what they wanted was for me to more focus on the gourmet side because that sounds good, sounds appealing. Oh, isn't and, that interesting? And for those people who really are focused on health and nutrition, right. they're going to read the label, they're going to read the ingredients, but don't lead with that. So you're like, oh, wow, this sounds delicious and it's good, so now I, it's a win-win. Oh, so they want you to do something that's more appealing to the brain. Yes. Which, which, from a marketing standpoint, it makes perfect sense, right? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh, so your inspir. We talked. Of, did we talk about your inspiration for 
for creating this. You talked about the family values, people getting together. There's got to be more to this because I know that you're a very complex man. Oh, stop. <laughs> so I, I talked about some of the different motivations and drivers and things like that. But... Um, we didn't talk about smart choices because <laughs> well, that's... That, well, that was, that was when I was trying to figure out... Uh, that was really when I was working on what the value of the brand was. And I realized that it was very hard for a consumer <clears throat> who had to go into a store, make instantaneous decisions because they're trying to grab some stuff for dinner right. or trying to get the shopping done to get out of there <clears throat> to make a brand that they could actually trust, that they knew would always be healthy. And, and so, for instance, like you'll see a, on the front cover of a, of a box, it might say, a full serving of vegetables. Or, um, but it's, there's no real vegetables in there. They're just saying like it's the equivalent to vegetables. Or I always get. How can they get away with that? Well, there's a lot of stuff they can get away with on the marketing, but um, I always like it. Like you, you read a, like a pop tart, and it will say um, made with real fruit. But it's not. <laughs> well, there's probably some real fruit in there somewhere. It doesn't say it's all real fruit. It just says with real fruit. So, so it could be just a tiny little trace. And it's actually a true statement. <laughs> it is a true statement. So, um, as one person said, never trust what you see on the front of the box because that's all the marketing stuff. It's the back of the stuff that they have to be in compliance, the nutritional panel and the ingredient statement. Well, they're going to be changing labels very soon where they have to state certain things. I don't know what's, what it's going to have. Tell us about smart choices. You were talking about this earlier and this blew my mind. Well, what I was, that's when I was looking at the same kind of discussion. How would a consumer know what was a, uh, a good or bad product in the food labeling, food marketing? So you have things like the, um, the American Association had like the Healthy Heart and the, and the American Diabetes Association had something similar. And so the food industry had tried to come up with their own uh, marketing logo that people would um, pick when they were in the grocery store, right? You're going down, you're lying to right. look at something. And so they came up with this uh, thing called Smart Choices. And uh, it was very controversial. And then eventually, I think the FTC, you know, gave them a hard time because they, they had um, Cocoa Crispies. A lot of people Crisp are pulling, up, pulling away from them. Yes, yeah, so they had Cocoa Krispies and um, Fruit Loops listed as Smart Choices. And Which it, makes no sense. Uh, well, they tried to say that within the within the... The cereal category, they were the healthier, they were the smart choice within the sugar. Anyway, it, it was a very convoluted argument, but they won. I mean, temporarily, until the FTC and people like that said, that's not going to work. So part of what you have to understand with food, the way the food industry works, like the, like the FDA, et cetera, is that they have to try to please people on both sides. So if you look at the food, um, if you look at the food pyramid, it'll have meat, beef, whatever, right, as part yeah, of it. And there's all these different pyramids, all these different ways we're supposed to follow. It never stays the same. Who's right? So I'm just simply saying is that you really don't have to have beef as part of your diet to be healthy. But what if you like beef? You can, I don't know. I'm saying you can have it. But I'm saying part of what I'm trying to explain is as a, as a way to sort of appease the that industry, you're going to make beef part of your diet. So that's why it's part of the food pyramid. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, you have people who I say want to be all organic and all natural, whatever. And so they're always just trying to mediate between the two. And so it's not like an official objective referee. They're just trying to say, I've got conflicting things here. How do I mediate the different sides? Okay, so... So, for instance, so I'm, I'm still going to eat my barbecue ribs. I'm still going to eat my steak and, and all that. And what are you going to put on the ribs? Are you going to put all that barbecue sauce that's full of the sugar and it's full of the salt? <laughs> what are you going to do? And do you have your own barbecue sauce? So, so the answer is um, I would put on a barbecue sauce, <clears throat> but it, I use the same kind of... Um, same kind of techniques. So barbecue sauce is vary by region, right? So there's like a North Carolina style that's um, uh, mustard and vinegar. There's more of like a Kentucky, Tennessee. There's a Texas. So there's regional styles mm -hmm. of barbecue. <clears throat> but part of the problem is most barbecue sauces contain some honey or some molasses, maple mm -hmm. syrup, real sugar. And it's very competitive. So the ones that are, that are successful in a different way are the ones that do no sugar, sugar-free, whatever. So how they get there, you may or may not like. 
So in our particular case, uh, we're, we're confident that we can create a satisfying barbecue sauce um, in those various categories that doesn't have any sugar in it at all. I look forward to that. <laughs> well, so for instance, like again, if you do the, um, looks like the North Carolina style, we, we've looked at um, Peri Peri. It's a, it's a type of, like the Peri Peri sauce. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a type of pepper it's, it's found in South Africa. You might see it in some of the hot sauce categories. But we can do that. Um, then again, you know, we might do a barbecue with. So, for instance, in the barbecue sauce category, I'm interested in the um, Irish cream, like the Bailey's ice cream, like that taste. Oh, really? On a, <laughs> on spare ribs? Well, the idea is it's a, it gives barbecue a very interesting flavor, and it's different. It's unique. I, I, you know what? I'm open. So I've done that. Um, vanilla. And how do you create Irish cream without the dairy? Well, I'm just trying to say that if you have like the Baileys, that taste. Right. So it doesn't, again, it doesn't have to have dairy. All we're trying to do is get that taste a okay. across. Okay, I'm open. When can we expect to see all your products on shelves? Well, um, when When is that going to happen? <laughs> well, it may not start on shelves. It may actually start in restaurants or universities, or whatever. So, okay. so it may start on the food mm -hmm. service side. So basically right now, um, about 50.2% of the people actually eat away from home or they eat out mm -hmm. or they eat and have their food delivered mm -hmm. and so we think that initially there might be the biggest opportunity to do the food service so if you have any friends out there that have restaurants or I or, do or they have like they, they're, they're the buyer for a university a hospital so hospitals are very interesting I we, know the perfect person to put you in front of so the hospitals for instance <laughs> nursing homes so for example like if you have a nursing home a sister living center they may have a they might have a diet for their, their clients yeah. Yeah. that says we don't want it to have more than 1,500 milligrams of sodium per day. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times the, 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 what do you call it, patients, visitors, guests, residents, they will complain because they'll say my food tastes so bland because they've taken all the seasoning out of it because most of the seasoning has to do with salt. So in right. our particular case, they don't have that problem because we never had salt in the mm -hmm. first place. Mm -hmm. um, I've had, I've had, um, parents who said we love you to bring the problem to our kids schools because we don't like all this stuff sure. that they're eating to, to so, the university sure so all these different kinds of things so that's why we're really interested on the food service side and and why why did you make the products allergen free well again the issue was um the trying to make it as inclusive as possible mm -hmm. And so, you know, somebody who has a gluten allergy, somebody who has a soy allergy. So if it's like soy, it turns out a lot of women have issues with soy because it messes up their hormonal Absolutely. system. Absolutely. So the idea was if we're going to make these really great products, why wouldn't we want to make it available to everybody? And therefore, let's just not use known allergens. So this is for everyone. The idea was to make it for everyone. So what role did Whole Foods play? Well, um, one of the things that was helpful is I took, uh, so once I had come up with these original concepts, mm -hmm. I actually took a bunch of classes from them. Oh, did you really? Yes. How was that? Well, because I took the classes on like nutrition and cooking and things like so that. So you did cook. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> actually cook. I took the cooking classes. It's okay. <laughs> No, because what I was what I was realizing is that there was like a whole group of people who felt this way, mm -hmm. and therefore I now understood um, what their philosophy was, what they were thinking, mm -hmm. how they worked, whatever. And so I sort of felt like I found people who were compatible, and um, so and there's tons of them. But but that was that was that those classes were really helpful because it sort of grounded me, and just so you know. Um, which is different. So even though I was starting a food company and I mm -hmm. mentioned all the different kinds of chefs and culinary people and food scientists and food chemists and all that I worked with, from day one we, we hired um, uh, certified dietitians. We, we had dietitians from day one. So we hired the dietitians at the wow. same time we hired the chefs. So we were using them to help guide on what the healthy was, unhealthy, and all the research. But anyway, but that's, that's a little bit different. But that just tells you how committed we were to this clinical understanding of nutrition. So we have a few minutes left. Um, we're going to join a movement. <laughs> we're going to join a movement. The Ed Gaskin movement. 
with Sunday celebrations, what would you like to leave our viewers? What would you like to say? Well, on the you have a couple of minutes. Go far. Well, on the movement part. Um, well, three minutes. <laughs> well, first of all, um, anybody that's interested in, in working with me, like especially like uh, people who are vegan chefs, mm -hmm. you know, because you know, there's that's like its own specialty. So part of how can they find you? Well, uh, it's E W Gaskin G A S K I N at gmail dot com. And you are in the Boston area. Yes. But anyone can reach you worldwide. Well, they can reach you, they can reach me. Right, of course. <laughs> so, but anyway, so, so vegan chefs, mm -hmm. um, because what we do is we start there, because that's already the fruit and vegetable base, and it's already vegan, right? Mm -hmm. So that means it already has no dairy, has no milk. So if we start with those kind of recipes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we develop it, we're almost halfway there. <laughs> um, people who like to cook, who do recipe development, we, so that's where we might do some experiments. So people like that already sort of have a feel for, so you're asking before about coming up with stuff. Mm -hmm. They already have a feel for this, so we would hire them, we work with them. Mm -hmm. uh, they already have a sense of taste, they already love cooking. Mm -hmm. um, well, we're always looking for investors, but we're looking for people who are really focused on thinking this is part of the healthcare system, as opposed to this is just what I want to do because I think that I can make a lot of money doing this. Um, so if they look at it more of like they say, like really what we're talking about, um, food as medicine, which goes back, you know, an Indian, um, Chinese has traditional Chinese medicine, food as medicine, and the West, uh, food as medicine. So that whole philosophy exists. It's just right now, food is over here and the healthcare system is over here. Never the two shall meet. Oh, no, no, <laughs> we will meet. That's all going to change. And you are going to be responsible for making that change. Well, I hope so. Plus, anybody that wants to join me and wants to help, who knows, they might have some other skills or contacts or whatever that they want to bring to the table so I'd love to have them so folks you heard it here from um, yeah you heard it here from Ed Gaskin founder of Sunday celebrations EW Gaskin at gmail.com that's right and uh, you're changing the world and I know that I I'm sure with all of our viewers uh, we all want to taste your wonderful products not a problem look i'm always to, looking for tasters yes looking forward to seeing everything on the store shelves and and it's it's great because it's never dull talking to you i'll tell you that right okay. now so thank you so much and I, somerville connects somerville connects